Hello, this is Marla Dalton, Executive Director and CEO of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. Welcome to Contagious Chronicles by NFID, featuring insights from trusted experts on the latest developments in infectious disease prevention and treatment. With me today are two esteemed colleagues and NFID leaders, Medical Director Dr. Bob Hopkins and Spokesperson Dr. Bill Schaffner, to talk about updated recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, to help protect against serious illness from respiratory viruses, including COVID-19, flu, and RSV. Thanks again for joining me, Bob and Bill, and for talking with us about the updated guidance. Good morning, Marla. Happy to be here with you. And hello, Marla. Good to be with you and Bob. Great. So let's dive right in. Bob, the CDC director, Dr. Mandy Cohen, has described these new recommendations as being simple, easy to follow, and designed to help protect those most at risk from common respiratory viruses. So why now, and what was the impetus for this change? The CDC has actively been monitoring what's been going on through this past three and a half years of COVID-19. And over the last several months, we've seen fewer hospitalizations and fewer deaths due to COVID-19. We now have tools, both vaccines and medications for treatment, that are widely available for COVID-19. We've developed a fairly high level of population immunity to COVID-19. So they see that we're moving out of the post-pandemic transition phase to what we might call the inter-pandemic phase. The winter peaks of COVID-19 more closely resembled influenza, although still higher in our 65-plus population. But for younger age groups, influenza and RSV had greater impact on hospitalization than did COVID-19. And I think it's particularly important to note that over 95% of those hospitalized this past winter for COVID-19 didn't have the 23-24 vaccine. And there's been less of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome as well. And I think on top of that, there's been a fair amount of confusion about different guidance for COVID-19, influenza, and for other respiratory illnesses on when to leave the protected space or the isolated space. Yeah, Bob, I could just emphasize that statistic that you mentioned. It's a killer statistic. 95% of the people continuing to be hospitalized for COVID have not taken advantage of the updated vaccine. That's very sobering and I would hope motivating. And then also the Omicron variant, this virus has changed. As we gain more knowledge, we're changing our recommendations. The Omicron variant is less severe than Delta was. So it seems like a good time to have changed these guidance. So, Bill, can you summarize this updated guidance in just a few words? The basis for the guidance is, of course, vaccination. And there's that killer statistic that 95% of the people who've been hospitalized recently for COVID have not taken advantage of the updated vaccine. That's very important. So, vaccination. But the aspect of the new guidance that's received so much attention has to do with what happens once you become sick and you know you have COVID. For how long should you isolate yourself? And the new guidance suggests that if your fever is down and you haven't been using any fever-reducing medicine, if your fever is down and your symptoms are improving, then you can go out into the world, back to school or whatever. But if you're in close contact with other people, please wear a mask and do so for the next five days because that will clearly help prevent spread to others. That's the basics. Vaccinate. If you're sick, isolate. If you're getting better, your fever is down and you're feeling better, you can go out and about. Actually, I think that's what most people have been doing. <laughs> yeah, Bill, I would just emphasize that latter point, that those additional protections, that five days after you go out and about, practicing our good hygiene, washing our hands, coughing or sneezing into your sleeve as opposed to your hand, taking steps for cleaner air, 
keeping away from others, particularly those that may be at risk, and wearing that well-fitting mask, those are as equally important to how long you've been away from others because of that COVID-19 infection. And finally, that this guidance is for the public and general situations. It doesn't replace the guidance that's in place for healthcare that has not changed. I'll add on to that and say, what should people do if they think they have been exposed to flu, COVID, or RSV? I would start with, first, a little bit of a personal risk assessment. Am I somebody that is 65 or older, or maybe hasn't been vaccinated, or maybe has an immune-suppressing condition or other chronic health conditions? If you fit into any of those groups, you really need to be watching carefully for symptoms, because if your symptoms start you're somebody that needs to get in and get tested for COVID-19 and for flu in particular because we've got some effective antivirals to use that may reduce your risk for severe disease. I would also recommend that people wear that fitting mask because what you've been exposed to, you don't want to take a chance that you're going to give it to someone else. I certainly agree with that. And I would put the emphasis once again, as you have done, Bob, on people who are at higher risk of serious disease. Those people need to be self-aware. They need to take part of this responsibility because if they start getting symptoms, don't wait. Contact your health care provider. They may want to test you because, after all, if you have either flu and you're at high risk or COVID and you're at high risk, we have medications that can help prevent your illness from evolving, getting more severe, so that you do require hospitalization. Folks, particularly at high risk, have got to be especially aware and spring into action should they become sick. Call that healthcare provider or send them an email. So, Bill, following on that, those that are at higher risk, including older adults and those with weakened immune systems, there's been some concern that this new guidance doesn't go far enough for them specifically. Can you shed any light on that? I think people who are at high risk have to take some responsibility for themselves and be ready to act. As Dr. Mandy Cohen, the director of the CDC, likes to remind us, to use another example, car accidents cause an enormous amount of deaths and injuries each year. But we don't tell people to not drive cars. We say drive safely wear your seat belts, don't drive and drink at the same time. We've got to do things that are reasonable and practical, and individuals have to take some of that responsibility for themselves. I was just going to say, so I better put my seat belts on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to give you both an opportunity to share some tips, but I'll start with you, Bob. Things we can do on a regular basis, not just when we're sick or we think we may have been exposed, but everyday actions to help prevent the spread of disease. First and foremost, and I'm speaking particularly to that almost 80% of the population that haven't gotten their most recent updated COVID-19 vaccine, get vaccinated. The COVID-19 vaccine, the influenza vaccine, the RSV vaccine for those that are eligible for RSV vaccine, all of those are critically important preventive tools to reduce the likelihood of people ending up in the hospital, having severe disease, or heaven forbid, dying. We certainly all need to be washing our hands, covering our coughs and our sneezes, whether we think it's allergic or we think it's a viral illness. You don't want to take a chance of the material from your nose ending up in your hand and ending up in someone else. Stay home when you're sick. And oh yeah, I almost forgot, get vaccinated. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm going to sing in the choir. Vaccination is absolutely fundamental. Should you develop symptoms and you're in a high-risk group, please get tested. Hand washing, of course, is important. And if you're at high risk, even now, put on your mask when you go to the supermarket or religious services or to that basketball game, because a mask, although not perfect, will still provide a layer of protection for yourself and potentially for others also. I guess it's all what we like to say at NFID, just don't be a dreaded spreader. (laughs) That's right. So thanks again for your valuable insights, Bob and Bill, and thank you all for tuning in to Contagious Chronicles. If you have a burning question for NFID experts, 
please submit online at nfid.org slash contact. Your question may just show up in a future episode of Contagious Chronicles.